Hi, I'm Mark Madison, Conservation Historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you to A Distance Learning with Dr. Jim Duke. We're very fortunate today to have Dr. Duke with us. Dr. Duke is an expert on ethnobotany and the medicinal uses of plants. He worked for the USDA for approximately 30 years. Uh, many have called him the world's greatest herbalist and the original medicine man. And thank you very much for being here today, Jim. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me to this wonderful <laughs> teaching facility. It's our pleasure. And, and Jim, usually the first question I ask folks is, um, how did you get into the field? How did you, how'd you get into ethnobotany in those early days? I'm 72 now, but when I was five down in the outskirts of Birmingham, Alabama, there was an old man across the street who didn't have anybody to talk to except his rabbits and me. <laughs> And he would take me out to the hills of Birmingham. And speaking of conservation, that was back when we had chestnuts. And he taught me the chestnut, and he taught me the watercress in the stream there. And ever since then, I've been interested in living off the land. And that, of course, led to the usual high school interest in identifying the wildflowers around. And by the time I got to college, I knew the wildflowers as well as many of my botany professors. And to this day, um, I'm a grazer. I was grazing across the river in Virginia just this morning. Um, tickled my throat a couple of times, but I got a lot of things that my ancestors got more of than we normally get today. But all my life I've been interested in the outdoors. And as far as medical botany though, that was when I was working for the Atomic Energy Commission, of all things, in Panama. It was a midlife conversion, shall we say. I was sent there to learn everything that the Native Americans were consuming from the environment. I had my family with me. My kids were in the Panama Canal Zone with the best of medicine. And here I was out in the jungle with what I then thought might be the worst of medicine, the jungle medicine. But the kids of the Native Americans there were just as happy and healthy as my kids back in the Panama Canal Zone. And at that point, I started a database, which is still online at the USDA, looking into the chemistry of the herbs that might explain the folk use. And the more I dig and the older I get, the more I think the old folks knew what they were talking about. And you pretty much devoted the rest of your life to, to yeah, that. Yeah, my whole career with the USDA was into a very interesting, for example, screening for anti-cancer activity for five years looking for alternative crops for narcotic crops, which really gets you into the medicinal crops because they're lightweight and high priced as well. So I had one of the most marvelous careers with the USDA possible, traveling all over under the most interesting circumstances. Wonderful, wonderful. I'd just like to uh, remind folks who are tuning into this distance learning, uh, please call in with any questions you might have for Dr. Duke. And also somewhat later on in the broadcast, We'll put up the web page. Uh, Jim has been uh, done a, an amazing job and, and put up a phytochemical and ethnobotanical database uh, homepage where you can find out just about any information you might want about an herb or a plant and its derivation and its quality. So we'll put that URL up a little later, but please do call in or fax in a question because uh, we've got Jim for the next 50 minutes or so. Well, let me ask you, you, you've been called the world's greatest herbalist, and, and let me begin with a very basic question. Um, for those folks who might be here who aren't botanists, what, what is the difference between a herb and a different type of plant? Well, I could probably find you for as many, as many definitions for herbs as there are herbs. The broadest definition is any useful plant. But if you analyze that, all plants are useful. In that broadest of definition, all plants are herbs. Why are they all useful? Because all green plants are taking carbon dioxide and water and making food and oxygen, both of which we need. And they're in many cases scrubbing pollution out of the air, although some of them actually make pollution, I'll have to confess. So and Reagan was right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Reagan should have had perhaps a little bit more rosemary, which has some anti-acetyl cholinesterase activity, which might slow the ravages of Alzheimer's. But uh, the plants really save our planet and make the air that we breathe, especially my Amazonian plants. That's the lungs of the hemisphere, they say. Now, when people use herbs, mm -hmm. are they primarily using the leaves and the stems of the herbs, or are they using the roots of the herbs, or does it that vary? Fits, that fits into another definition. Uh, the difference between an herb and a spice, and an old USDA definition said that herbs were mostly temperate leaves. 
and spices were mostly tempered roots and seeds. And that, that, like all definitions, can be broken down, but that holds true. Uh, but when you're taking herbal medicine, let's, let's just look at the top ten here in the United States. The first, echinacea, would fit into the, the, any definition of herb. It's an herbaceous plant that is mm -hmm. not woody. It's useful in the sense that it's ornamental, that it's medicinal, and it's widely used by the American Indian. But then we have the introduced ginkgo, which is in the top ten. That's a tree, and a lot of people balk at calling a tree an herb because it is woody. And then we have the ginseng that you mm -hmm. might know from Marathon County or here yeah. in this county in West Virginia. It's native here. and. It's one that's of concern to conservationists with good reason. It's that and golden seal and now black cohosh are in trouble here in the East Coast because of a little bit of uh, overpromotion in the herbal world. But the black cohosh is an American Indian herbal plant, herbaceous, growing in the forest here, that's better studied in Europe than it's studied here in America. That's also true of the saw palmetto, which is in the top 10. That's a Native American food plant from the Everglades. Much better studied in Germany than here in the United States. And cranberry, there's another Native American herb. Not much bigger than this, but mm -hmm. still it's woody. Right. And it's a great edible plant, great medicinal plant. And I have it growing in an artificial bog in my side slope garden at home. But many of these things you're taking in the can cranberry, it's the berry that's the medicine. As you know, with the ginseng up in Marathon County, it's the root that's the medicine. Yes. Uh, with the saw palmetto, it's the fruit and the seed. With the black cohosh, it's the root, and much better studied in Germany than here. And uh, then with the classical herbs, more like rosemary, thyme, and sage, it's more often the leaves that are used. But I would hate to make any generalizations there. And in some cases, one society might be using the leaf for something. Another society might be using the fruit for something. A wild one, hawthorn, one of the best herbs out there for heart. Commission E, Germany's uh, sort of high priest on herbal use, has approved only the combination of the fruit and the leaf. They don't approve the leaf, they don't approve the fruit, and I have eaten the fruit and find it a useful medicine, but it depends on the culture, the use, and if I put out a generalization, somebody would call in and break it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you talked a little about plant conservation and, and over-harvesting, and, mm -hmm. and coincidentally, we have golden seal on your poster, because it's an endangered species. I saw that we, beautiful poster yes. this morning, thanks. <laughs> and, uh, do you worry at times um, promoting medicinal properties of plants that, that might be threatened? I worry because, yes, uh, hungry people make very poor conservationists, be it in the Amazon or be it here in West Virginia. Uh, as they say, ginseng moves at night because ginseng can sometimes draw two to three hundred dollars a pound and people right. who have hungry children are not liable to respect the rules when their children are crying with hunger. And that's why I encourage the cultivation of these things. But let's get specific to the golden seal. Okay. In my garden at home, I have herbs that contain the same active ingredient, the major one being berberine. Now this morning across the river in Virginia, I showed a group of about 25 in the woods, barberry. If you peel back the bark of the barberry, you see that same yellow you see in the mm -hmm. root of the golden seal, and you've got that same compound, berberine. Now we're talking about golden seal, which is endangered, and we're talking about barberry, which even has a price on its head in some states as a weed, mm -hmm. because it's an alternative host for some pathogens. If we could prove that that barberry was as good as the golden seal and was a weed, we could perhaps take some of the pressure off the golden seal. Yes. And that's why I'm getting five different sources of berberine analyzed, and I'll go into that in detail. Gold thread, a very small thing in bogs up in Maine and in China and in India. The barberry that we just mentioned. Argan grape, which is a frequent source out west and a cultivated thing. And then we've got the golden seal itself. And in Alabama, where I grew up with Tommy Bass, uh, thing called yellow root, meaning yellow root, all contain berberine. 
Two of them also contain a newly discovered drug, 5-methoxyhydnocarpine, big word. Now I'm going to pull out a bigger word. These are multiple drug resistant drug efflux pump inhibitors. How's that? <laughs> you want to they, translate that? <laughs> I hope I can translate that. I barely can say it. But these, this compound will prevent a bacteria from pumping out antibiotics. Bacteria have outsmarted many of our drugs and can pump them right back out as fast as we pump them in. And this 5-methoxyhydnocarpine prevents the bacteria from pumping out the poison. Now, berberine plus the 5-MHC is more liable to help with such things as drug-resistant tuberculosis right. than a silver bullet pharmaceutical to which the bacteria has already become accustomed and it's almost fertilizer for the bacteria anymore, some of our antibiotics. They're eating vancomycin now. Yeah. So we've got to go back to the herbs and a combination of several alkaloids and both the barberry, the gold seal, the gold thread, the yellow root all contain a suite of five to a dozen alkaloids that either work synergistically or antagonistically. And it's harder for a bacteria to outsmart 12 enemies than it is to outsmart one enemy. That's a good explanation. Mm -hmm. I think we have a call from Jeannie in West Virginia. Hi, um, Mr. Duke, I was wondering, um, when you talk about people going out and harvesting um, like the ginseng and everything, I guess I assumed that, that they were cultivated by companies in greenhouses, but do uh, every time I would buy Echinacea Golden Seal or something like that, I'm buying something that people just went out and harvested in the wild? Again, that's a very good question. And I would say that much of the golden seal could have been harvested in the wild in the past. But there is intensive cultivation of that by my friends out in Oregon and Washington State who are growing it in shade like ginseng. The golden seal needs shade. The echinacea uh, is both harvested in the wild, sometimes destructively, but it can be cultivated. It's easy growing. It's almost a weed at my place. And the species that seems to have the most studies behind it is by no means endangered. But some of our collectors aren't very good, what we'll call plant taxonomists. And they may harvest an endangered species thinking it's a common species. So there are problems. And yes, sometimes when you buy, even if it claims that it's uh, all cultivated, you can't always be sure. There's really nothing I can do when I go out and buy one of these supplements to know whether it's been done wisely or not, right? Ask, ask the dealer, and if it's a good dealer, he will know which people are sponsoring cultivated, especially golden seal. Ginseng is more, there's more of it produced uh, in cultivation under lath than harvest grown. And, but much of that is exported to China, it turns out. And there's more and more cultivation of both ginseng and golden seal, and I predict that soon we'll have black cohosh going under cultivation because it's pressure on the black cohosh in the wild. There's a new drug in America, relatively speaking, called remifemin. I say new. If I look at my German literature, way back to 1939, I can find a remifemin mentioned in Germany based on an American Indian plant that used to be in Lydia Pinkham's compound black cohosh, now getting close to endangered here in West Virginia and in my state of Maryland. Well, thank you very much. My I pleasure. Jeannie, did that answer your question? I guess she's off the line. Thanks she a said, lot. thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, we can assume that. I tend to wiggle around a lot when I get a <laughs> tough question like that. But th th what you were talking about before brings up something I read in your, one of your books recently, uh, in the, where you made a, a claim that uh, in, in some ways herbs or um, botanical uh, medicines might be better for humans because we, we've kind of co-evolved for, for thousands of years. Uh, it, I'm this, simplifying it, but and that was the gist of the argument. It's another complex argument, but uh, I maintain that most of the herbs that have been handed down to us by an our ancestors, mm -hmm. not brand new things that we know nothing about, are in general, on average, safer than a new pharmaceutical. Now, why would I make a statement like this? Let's base it on the General Accounting Office, GAO, which about 10 years ago published figures showing that in one 10-year period, over half of the newly approved, FDA-approved drugs 
had to be recalled within the first 10 years for relabeling or completely recalled because of side effects that were not anticipated in the half billion dollar study that proved them safe and efficacious. Now, this tells me that they're not the safest and even the FDA today will tell you not to get on the bandwagon and buy the brand newest drug because you become the guinea pig. There are lots of drugs that have been on the market in only two or three years and they're the ones that most advertise on television today right. but the least studied. On the other hand, my genes have co-evolved with many of the chemicals that are useful in plants. If you believe in the African theory of origin of man, as I tend to believe lately, my genes have known genistein, the estrogenic isoflavone in the soybean, but also in all the beans here in West Virginia. My genes have known that for five million years. My genes can't have known tamoxifen for more than 25 years or raloxifen for more than five years. They weren't around until right. then. So my genes have had a lot of opportunity to learn to both benefit from and to protect itself from overdoses of the natural compounds. Through a process of homeostasis, the body grabs what it needs from the herbal potpourri and excludes what it doesn't need up to a degree. Now let's talk conservation. I regret that I didn't bring a, a Brazil nut with me because Brazil nuts and rubber, and I do have a piece of rubber over there on the table. Grab that for you. Brazil nuts yeah. and rubber in the Amazonian rainforest, to which I almost commute, <laughs> over a 10-year period r will return more dollars to the Native American than if you felled that rainforest and replanted it with soybean or with cattle. Now, we tend to fell that forest, knocking down many, many unknown species which contain unknown chemicals, which might contain the cure to unknown diseases. Now that's getting pretty There's some far. movies about that topic. Right, Medicine, <laughs> Medicine Man, Man yeah. as I recall. And no, I am not the pattern for Medicine Man, but we do tend to run around <laughs> barefooted and in the treetops. You'll see my treetop canopy walkway yes, here yes. from the Amazon. We'll be going back in October with continuing education credit for pharmacists and for physicians. 80% of the people who come to the Amazon with me want to come back, 23% do. We have a high recidivism rate there. And they will see the rubber and they will see the Brazil nut. But then I'll tell them the Brazil nut has never been successfully cultivated outside the Amazon basin. Three Brazil nuts, believe it or not, will give you, if they're Lake Wobegon average, will give you 200 micrograms of selenium. And those 200 micrograms, at least epidemiologically, have been shown to prevent the three cancers I'm most liable to get. Colon cancer because of my genes. Uh, lung cancer because I have 90 pack years behind me. I don't smoke now, but for too many years mm -hmm. I was three packs a day. And then because of my sex, I'm liable to get prostate cancer. But three Brazil nuts a day will give you the selenium that could at least lower your chances of getting those three cancers. So save that Amazon rainforest, it might save you. We don't need any more soybeans. we got plenty of soybeans. And a lot of people, especially in these bad cow days, could say we might have enough cattle too. <laughs> well, you, you have actually done a lot of work in, in rainforests and in Africa, South America, Central America, even Australia, I think. You've I finally got to Australia, <laughs> and they even claimed that I was the basis for Medicine Man over there. And had, it's, it's a rampant rumor we might have been guilty of promoting. Um, what, what I've read more intelligently is uh, you or people like you are inspiration for uh, for that figure who's a, a composite. Well, uh, I've certainly had an interesting <laughs> career and that certainly was an interesting movie. And come to the Amazon with me in October and you will <laughs> find me dancing with the natives and making music with the natives. Almost all of our guides, who are trilingual by the way, not only know the, the birds and the bees and the flowers, but they also can play mariachi music. <laughs> we don't have electricity, but cold water, et cetera, comes down the river daily. And it's a whole lot more comfortable than my early days <laughs> as an ethnobotanist in Panama where I cut my eye teeth. 
Those days I would spend 95% of my time getting somewhere and surviving and the other 5% collecting data. Now with these, I'll call them elegant tours, even Mrs. Duke said that was more comfortable than she expected. <laughs> Uh, I have three square meals waiting for me, and I spend four hours between those meals traveling with the native and the guides and studying what's there. And actually, I have taken species to them that are useful to them. I'm not trying to rip them off. Right. They uh, have some good medicines, and they can learn from us as well. It brings up an interesting question. First, I'd, I'd like to try and go to a, a picture. Uh, we might have a, a view with some indigenous peoples, and maybe you could give uh -oh, us some background. I know which one this <laughs> one is. Up? is that the one you were guessing? That's the one I would have predicted. Uh, wh where was this taken? This was taken uh, downstream from Iquitos, Peru, in the Yagua village. It was called Cocomira. And uh, some of the tales about the Amazon women uh, may have been Amazon men because <laughs> the men wear grass skirts, you see there. Yep. Those grasses uh, are actually stained with uh, some palm dyes. And those are the Yagua Indians who made the blowgun that we have over there. You see the blowgun uh, yeah, over the, there? Yeah, the long one here? Yeah. And bring this from a point of view of medicine, this is super because the darts that were used in this gun were coated with poisons that it turns out contain very potent muscle relaxants. And all except one of our modern open heart surgery muscle relaxants are either derived from that same plant and its compounds, the alkaloid tubocorarine, mm -hmm. or are copycat synthetic molecules. But uh, in a sense, we owe our open heart surgery, or at least that part of it, to the dye. Now, it, another amazing thing about this is there are over 10 different plants represented in this device made really? from the jungle. Yeah, this is kin to the mulberry, almost as light as balsa. That's the mouth part. This is the bark of a vine that's wrapped around a nutmeg relative, which has been split and reamed with a palm to make a long, straight barrel. And then this black is the tar, sort of like I was getting tar from a cherry tree, This the gum. But this is more like a pitch. That comes from a, a balsam relative there. And then the darts are made from the leaf stalk of a palm. And are get, those the darts over yeah, there? Yeah, get me the little one. That's a, my grandkids' version of the <laughs> blowgun. The darts, you may have seen a kid's book called The Kapok Tree. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from the Kapok Tree, a huge saba that you get in Africa as well. And that's put on the one end and twirls so that it gives you some pressure. But this, whoops, this is the Don't business. stab yourself with it. <laughs> this is the business end wherein goes the poison. And the poison, at least my Yagua Indian friend in the last picture, he claims to have over 200 ingredients in there, but he's trying to throw you off track. <laughs> but we, we have learned that the, most of the dark poisons do contain that tubocorarine and two other alkaloids that come from the strychnine plant, strychnine being an alkaloid, mm -hmm. and brucine, both of which are used in modern medicine as well. So that tubocorarine that was on this dart is where we got some of our muscle relaxant medicines of today. Fascinating. And those guides, from the negative point of view of conservation, you don't hear this thing when it goes off in the jungle. And they can hit a monkey at 30 meters with one of these. They gauge the power of the monkey, of the poison, excuse me, of how many trees the monkey gets to before it falls to the ground. Strangely, if they wished, they could bring the monkey back to life with artificial respiration because he's collapsed from not his muscles are so relaxed that he's not breathing properly anymore. But artificial respiration would bring him around. Do they finish him off then somehow since they don't want to bring him back? Uh, lots of times, again, from a negative point of view, these were sold in illicit markets in the village. Early on, they were eaten. I confess that in my jungle days in Panama, it's a pretty gory picture, but I have pictures of my guide sucking the brain out of a barbecued monkey skull. I didn't have the brain, but I had other parts of the monkey, and it wasn't bad. Uh, 
I was studying the food chain then, and what better way to study it? <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about a strange loop in the food chain. The monkey that they killed up in the mountains had a baby, and they took the live baby monkey down to their river hut. The next day, I got pictures of the baby monkey nursing on a Choco Indian female. There's a strange kick in the yeah. food. I have pictures of the Choco Indians with pigs, dogs, and monkeys nursing. And they thought nothing. They were just amazed that I should be so curious and want a picture of this. Oh <laughs> this was natural. <laughs> the town pump, shall we say. But uh, that was one of several strange kickbacks in the food chain yeah. there. And my job was to study all of the food chain in case we were to dig a sea level canal there, how it might affect it. It raises an interesting question, though. You said, you know, some of the, the indigenous folks would, would claim there were more chemicals in here or more ingredients in here than there actually were, or they were amazed that what you found interesting, what they didn't found, find interesting. Um, how do you solicit information from different cultures? How do you, how do you get them to share <coughs> things that, that might have value to them as knowledge and they might not want to share? <coughs> you brought me to a confessional, you know. <laughs> but in many cases in Peru now, I intentionally go out and never ask a question. I just talk incessantly <laughs> to my English visitors and the more knowledgeable among those who understand the English finally get a bothered by what I'm saying and sort of volunteer, but we use that for so-and-so. <laughs> and when I was working in Panama, I was working with two different American Indian groups and they didn't like each other. So when I'd be traveling with one group, I would say, well, the other group uses this for so-and-so, and they'd get all haughty and say, well, they don't know what they're talking about. It's really good for so-and-so. And I really don't like to write anything down until I've heard it from three different informants because too often uh, indigenous people here and there mm -hmm. uh, would rather give you the answer they think you want than say, I don't know or it ain't good for nothing. If, if In Latin America, if a plant doesn't have a name, it's probably not very useful. And so I never, if they didn't have a name for it, I didn't ask any more about it, nor did I even collect a specimen for the National Cancer Institute, because if it didn't have a name, it was not a medicine. But the things that are very important in their life will have very often very short names, and the longer the name, the less the importance. That makes sense. Well, Jim, we're approaching the halfway mark here, mm -hmm. and I thought we'd, we'd kind of switch gears for a second. You're you're also an accomplished musician, and uh, you've you've uh, had a CD come out, and and the first question is: Is it pronounced herbal bum or herb album? Well, <laughs> what is the look uh, at this long-haired, barefooted <laughs> dude? What do you think? <laughs> I think it could go either and, way. And you know, I brought all my goodies in in a bag. I look like a Washington <laughs> bag man. I think herbal bum is the herbal correct bum. Well, I, I was wondering if you uh, might be willing to to play us a song. Well. I just happen to have my guitar <laughs> yeah, with me, we'll move and I don't play pipe. very good blow <laughs> Take this out of your way. And please tell us what song you're going to play. Well, since we're talking West Virginia, uh, let's sing one about a West Virginia herb that's not endangered okay. and has led to a very important anti-cancer medicine. And you probably don't even know about this unless uh, you've been reading the book more than most people have. Uh, Jonathan Hartwell was a full-time National Cancer Institute scientist, chemist by profession, and he did a great compilation of 3,000 plants used against cancer. It was folklore, granted, but one of them particularly interested him. It was the May apple, and it was his claim that the Penobscot Indians of Maine used it for cancer. And finally, in 1984, Bristol Myers, who had been looking at many natural products, modified a compound in the May apple to make a drug that was called etoposide, which became uh, used, it was approved for testicular cancer in 1984. Then in 1985, I wrote and published this song, and if you don't believe it, I can prove it by the Blue Book Herb, herb Album. <laughs> Uh, and in which I, I said the following line, I'll venture to prognosticate before my song is sung, this herb will help alleviate 
I believe I said eradicate, but that was optimistic, alleviate cancer of the lung. And then in 1986, it was further approved for small cell lung cancer, which ironically takes about 100,000 American lives a year. Mm -hmm. So the American Indian, the Native American, gave us tobacco, which causes cancer. The American Indian gave us the lobelia, or wild tobacco, which grows right around here as a weed, which contains an alkaloid lobeline, which will help you quit smoking. I quit smoking without, and thank goodness I did. And then he told us that the mayapple might be good for cancer, and now there is this drug, etoposide, which I understand sold for about $400 million last year. So it was first approved in 1984, and this is a song that was published in 1985, and I think it still plays in Australia, but it doesn't play very much. <laughs> I didn't hear it when I was on it. <laughs> Penobscot engines up in Maine had a very pithy saying, rub the root most every day. It will take your warts away. Yes, you see there's a resin in the rhizome or underground stem of the May apple. It's called podophyllin, and podophyllin has been the drug of choice for venereal warts for close to 50 years. And now here's First one. time that topic's come up in a distance learning, <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Farther south, the Cherokee, echoing Menominee, they made a tea out of the roots to keep the bugs off potato shoots. So you got the Cherokee and the Menominee saying that May Apple will keep potato bugs off. Mm -hmm. I took that to the USDA. Martin Jacobson was over the organic uh, pesticide man. I said, Martin, did you know the Penobscot Indians said May Apple was good for cancer and now there's a cancer drug for May Apple? And Martin, did you know that the Cherokee and the Menominee said it was also good for keeping potato bugs off? He said, nope. I said, well, there must be something to this folklore. And he had his troops uh, extract the May apple. And yes, it did repel the Colorado potato beetle. But like the drug industry, he wanted to find a single silver bullet in the May apple. So he got finer and finer fractions, more expensive fractions with more concentration. And the farther down the pipeline he got, the less repellency he got. So after a year, he lost interest. But still, the whole mayapple will do the trick. You can demonstrate it in your own backyard using mayapple leaves for mulch. And then there's that. I'll venture to prognosticate before my song is sung. This herb will help alleviate cancer of your lung. May apple lemonade, the wildest thing my mama made, the coolest thing there in the shade. Swing your partner and promenade. And there you have the May apple song. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very, very nice. What is the connection between your music and your work? Besides the obvious subject matter, but do you, does that help you get your message across? Well, it certainly disarms people who usually have some tough questions. If I get up and sing, they forget their questions. <laughs> so I tend to close out a lot of my talks with this, and then they forget that hardcore question they have. On the other hand, uh, I think hearing a verse sort of reinforces, makes it easier for people to remember that it keeps the bugs off potato shoots. So mm -hmm. It might have something to it. And... It makes a boring lecture. It puts a little variation into a boring, long-winded lecture. My poor wife has heard 400 of my lectures, and she says she always hears something new at each lecture, but most of it is repetitious. And it's nice on a first visit with me to hear it repeated two or three times because I can always overwhelm you, be it in the Amazon or here in West Virginia early on, and if I overwhelm you, then you don't ask me so many questions about things I don't know. I like to give you the things I know, get you overwhelmed before you come up with the questions <laughs> that I don't know the answers to. And of course, like most botanists, uh, it's embarrassing not to recognize everything. Up here, I look for the things that I don't know. 
in the Amazon, I look for the things that I know so I can talk about those before you ask me what that huge <laughs> tree is over there that looks just like this huge tree over there. But this is very important from a conservation point of view. Where we go in the Amazon, the species diversity is 300 woody species per hectare. Up here in West Virginia and Maryland, I'm going to estimate that a hectare of natural forest, as it evolves without help from us, would contain about six woody species per hectare. So you've got a 50 times greater species diversity there in a region that's the least studied in the world, not only by primitive man, but by modern man. Remember, the Native American has been in America, according to most anthropologists, fewer than 25,000 years or so. Man was in Africa, Lucy, uh, five million years ago. Uh, so we've got more species, less studied, where I'm going to try to take you in the Amazon. <laughs> and each visit you make contributes $200 to the contribution and maintenance of a forest that has this diversity. The canopy walkway is a series of suspension bridges, medicine man style, yeah. between uh, 13 different trees, one of which was unknown to science when we started there. The canopy walkway went about my fourth or fifth visit. And I might add that when I first met my sh shaman there, he was hanging from a tree barefooted. But I had a slip disc that year and for that reason, I was walking through the forest barefooted and wanting to get better prehensile uh, grip on that Amazon mud. And I had a cervical collar barefoot, and my shaman had never seen a barefoot gringo in the, <laughs> in the forest before. So we bonded immediately. And since then, he's been sharing secrets with me and has taught me lots of things. And there are many times when what he tells me, I doubt. But each time I doubt him, before the cock crows thrice, something comes up to me. You see this little white line there? Yeah. Well, my shaman had a deeper circle around his wrist there. And on one particular day, I remember when he told me about that, I had decided we were going to walk all day, and I was not going to ask a single question. This is part, I want them to volunteer information. I don't want to force them into a corner with my question. And he started telling me about this scar. He said, well, some other Indians tied a vine around my wrist, and it hurt me mightily and blistered. And he said its name is Nina Caspi. Nina means burn, and Caspi means tree. Yeah. And he's older than the trilingual guides, so when I got back to the guides, they said, that significant signifies playing the flute, but it's also their euphemism for telling lies. He, he's BS in the troops there. And whenever you see him do that, they say, bull. <laughs> and I sort of believe that, you know, I'd been fed a line of bull. Two years later, we were in a swamp, and the shaman said, Ayata la Nina Caspi. There's the Nina Caspi. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to try it. Mm -hmm. So he shimmied up the, the, the tree stripped off some of the bark and wrapped it around my wrist here. And within an hour, I had a blister that big. Wow. And uh, at that point, I realized that he knew what he was talking about. When I got back to camp, we had some George Washington students with us. And they saw this macho <laughs> ring around my wrist, ring yeah. around the wrist, and they wanted one. And the shaman says, oh, it won't burn again. <laughs> So the shaman learned something from me that night. We moistened that Nina Caspi bark mm -hmm. and tied it around eight of those students. And some of them have much darker rings than I do. I'm not sensitive to poison ivy or most of the allergens. But those students were almost frightening with the reaction they got wow. to that. So we've discontinued that little part of the <laughs> <little> experiment. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's just one of the many cases where I doubted him and he was telling the truth. Now, there's no practical use to this that I can think of, right. but it just shows that if he disappears and we believe the young folks instead of him, that we'll be losing all sorts of strange information that in the future might have practical information. That's why Mark Plotkin over in Alexandria says uh, each time you lose a shaman it's like a library burning down because the oral tradition is, is the library 
and the right. shaman is the library. Oh, I've been to conferences with Plotkin. He's he's top notch. Yeah, he's been to the Amazon. I had to loan him my shaman back in 1994, and I taught <laughs> nutrition while he did my medicinal thing there. That was when his. So book you got him started with? <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, he and I go back a long way to Panama and Costa Rica. His his wife is Costa Rican. And it was his friend Lynn Cherry who did this beautiful book I have for kids called The Kapok Tree. And my granddaughter liked it so well that I had to read it two or three times. And I just filmed her last week on this just one verse to give you the idea. Okay. See me down on a stump in my Maryland farm in the forest, what I call Yin Yang Valley, with four grandchildren ranging from seven to ten. And tell them, showing them the same artifacts I'm showing you. <laughs> I'm saying I'm trying to rig up a grandfather, a granddaughter, grandson trip to the Amazon. We'll go down to the Cape Pock tree. Go down, down, just you and me. See a hundred birds and a hundred bees. And all those things that live in the trees. Now the Cape Pock tree is the granddaddy of them all. And my shaman told me that when he was nine, he was put between the buttresses of the Kapok tree with a little thatched roof so they had a little mini hut communicating with this tree. And that's how he learned the spirits of the forest. And I'm still doubting this because I don't see the spirits that he sees. But I'll bet that if I partake of his ayahuasca line, I will see the same <laughs> spirits that he does. But I won't do that with the grandchildren alone. <laughs> But that's the K-Pox song. Well, Jim, this song didn't work because you, you got a question. Uh -oh. <laughs> and it may be a hard question. I think uh, Colin from the Bureau of Land Management has a question. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, the song did work because <laughs> I was pretty much wowed with the story about the vine around the wrist. Um, I was, uh, you were talking a little bit about diversity, and I'm particularly interested in, in plant diversity and the loss of the plant diversity in the uh, developed nations, and obviously, uh, you know, you're working with the uh, uh, underdeveloped areas. But uh, the other thing I, I just wanted you to kind of weave in here a little bit, and I, I don't know how you can address it, but I'm concerned with uh, genetically modified organisms in the plant world, and the fact that you did mention earlier that there are plants that, you know, have been uh, integrated into those cultures and into the, uh, 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 the ecosystems there. Uh, is there you know, how do you feel about this, and do you think that this is a, a real threat, or is it something that uh, you think is going to be mitigated and not, not too much of a problem? I guess that's about it. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm retired, so, so I can say what I think. And I'm going to say it with a, with a sort of a parable, but you'll get the message, I, I think. You, you see how s sensitive I am sitting on this bench? But suppose I told you that a, a conventional hybrid or sport of a plant could potentiate one-third of medicines, making them dangerous. You might overdose on them with conventional uh, plant. Well, it turns out that the grapefruit is just that. All the citrus genes come to us from Asia, but somehow uh, the grapefruit arose here in America, but from genes that came from Asia. And the grapefruit is one plant that can potentiate, sometimes dangerously, one-third of the medicines that we have. Now, if a conventionally engineered plant can do that, might we expect similar things from unconventional, or shall we call it genetic engineered plants? And I fear that there are lots of monarchs in the mind to, to warn us to move slowly to make sure that we aren't being too too eager to accept. Do we really want to cross a pig with a Brazil nut? They have crossed the Brazil nut with the soy and introduced Brazil nut allergy to, uh, to the soy. That was a bad consequence of genetic engineering. And I suspect that as in most of our new discoveries and our, like our new drug, that we'll find problems down the road that we didn't find in our limited studies, the half billion studies that proved drugs safe and efficacious. I think we're doing those half billion dollar studies on the genetic GMOs now, and problems will come down the line. 
I refer to one particular one that bothers me. They're talking about making a yellow rice with high carotenoids uh, through genetic engineering. And the people that do this sell a lot of weed killers. But most native rice contains some edible weeds that would have more carotene in it than the genetically engineered rice. So my, my answer to that question would be, well, let's keep the rice that they enjoy and teach them to use these weeds like purslane and many edible weeds that are very good foods and rich in carotenoids and pull the weed instead of spraying the weed. Eat the weed instead of spraying the weed. In other words, go to the poor man's technology instead of two rich man's technologies that they can't afford. They might get hooked on them now at a cheaper price and then the price supports disappear. We have problems like this in Amazon when we have physicians come down and give them free hardcore pharmaceuticals. Then that physician disappears and they've forgotten their traditional. This is always a two-lane street and one has to contemplate such consequences. I fear there will be some skeletons in the closets of GMO, just as, as there are skeletons in the closets of some of our recent pharmaceuticals. Colin, thank you for the question. Yeah, you bet. Let me ask you this. Going back to talking about the shaman and so on, presumably the indigenous peoples, the Native Americans in South and Central America, um, don't have a profession called botanist or USDA botanist. Um, so, so how do they understand your work? Do they consider you a shaman or do they consider you a, a gatherer? Or, or how does that work? I should have brought my Martin Backpacker guitar because it has marked on it in green toenail polish my name, Brujo, which means witch. Witch? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they realize that I know more about some things, aspects of plants, and I have taught them some things about <laughs> plants. And th I think they have a great respect for the barefoot guy uh, <laughs> who can play the guitar <laughs> and s speak a little of their language and has a real intense interest in their culture and their plants and what they do with their plants. Let me show you the best one, though. Get that uh, belt uh, yes. with those seeds on it. You may have heard of the tonka bean, which is used uh, as a poor man's vanilla. This is the shell of the tonka bean, diptrix it's called, and it's wound together with palm fibers. And if you want to, we're going to have a, a lipolytic workshop on the Amazon where you come down with me and you would traipse through the jungle all day and then you eat rice and beans and lots of good things, lots of vegetables, not much fatty meat. But then after dinner, the mariachi boys start playing and then you put this on and you do your that. <laughs> and you'll lose a little weight. <laughs> but that's a You're going to have to lose weight, I think, to wear this. I don't know if this is made for the American waist here. No, <laughs> what is it, 28 or something? No, it was, it was made for the lady, not the gentleman. <laughs> But it's a very effective uh, maraca so, yeah. sort of thing. It goes very nicely with the ma mariachi music that we have on the Amazon. Let's look at some of the other things you have over sure. here. Sure. Uh, I've been able to, to look at them and admire them, but some of our audience has them. Uh, well, to tell us now about? we're looking at things that you can get in your suitcase. <laughs> okay. uh, the blowgun I don't intend to bring back anymore, much as I love it. This is, of course, they call me the five-toed sloth, but this is the three-toed sloth. The reason they call me the five-toed sloth is I taught them that the leaves of the guarumo tree, or satiko as they call it, are edible to humans as well as to the sloth. But if you're looking for a sloth when you see this big compound leaf along the rivers, you look up there, you don't see it, but the guides will always see it. The sloth is you look upside down, or sleep or munching on leaves. But this is made out of balsa wood and weighs almost nothing. And it's something you can trade them a t-shirt for and uh, it doesn't weigh any more than the dirty t-shirt. And they have to get a <laughs> dirty t-shirt. This is another one of the lightweight things, again, made out of balsa with an Amazon scene on it. The 
the canoe, the boats there have thatch roofs because they do get a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. But that's good for us gringos because the sun is terrific down there. Of course, their their real paddles are like the blowgun and the toy blowgun, huge things, and you just stick them when you come in shore and pull yourself in. But they are made from the buttresses of trees too, and there we'll get into that once again, what we call their binomial system. You remember Nina Caspi meant burn tree? Mm -hmm. This is Ramo Caspi, our paddle tree. And Ramo is their name for paddle. This is the Ramo. Ramo Caspi is the name of the very thin buttress tree, and they just whack it with a machete, and they've got enough for three or four paddles like this, already flattened out for them. They have a tree down there called the calabash tree, and this is the fruit which they carve, carve off some of the outer bark, or they can stain this with some of the native dyes, and it makes a very beautiful thing. And here the red and black seed is one of the tropical legumes, which is kind of dangerous. This one is not the real dangerous one, but one real dangerous one you shouldn't be drilling because if you slipped and drilled yourself, you could kill yourself injecting yourself with the inside of that seed. On the other hand, seeds of the canna, canna lily, which grows up here as an ornamental, they're put in there. And then you do have a maraca. I don't happen to have a maraca with me. And here I thought for my botanist friends, some of the crop seeds. Wow. Uh, sold at a tourist stall and very educational with their native names for the foods that they've evolved. Latin America has been much more generous to the world food basket than, than has uh, North America. Name three things you ate today that originated in North America. This is your quiz time. Name. That originated in North America? Mm -hmm. Well, I had Chinese, so oh, yeah. <laughs> at a disadvantage. I had, I had some rice, and I had some chicken, and I had uh, some broccoli. <laughs> okay, none of those are Native American. <laughs> okay. uh, native to North America, you would have Jerusalem artichoke, which is a very exciting sunflower. Uh, some of the grapes, some of the strawberries, the blueberries, and the cranberry. But Latin America has given me my life so it was the hot pepper, the potato, the green bean, the brown bean, the black bean, the pumpkin seed, which might save my prostate, the Brazil nut, which might save me from those cancers. Latin America has been much more generous to the world food situation. That's sort of another fertile crescent where all the other Asian herbs, uh, Eurasian herbs came and foods came to us. But uh, there, the diversity of crops is almost parallel to the diversity in the forest there. Oh, it's an incredible awesome. place. Jim, we're running out of time, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you one more question, and then uh, maybe we can go out with, with a song. And, and the question will be related oh. <laughs> to this. And, and that is just, what do you see as the, the number one challenge to conserving these medicinal plants? Here in North America, it's loss of habitat. Uh, many of the medicines are weeds, and we don't have to worry about them. But it's these deep forest things, this prime property in West Virginia, people moving out from the urban areas, and, mm -hmm. and they'll either knock down the forest or make it manicured with grass, right. replacing a very diverse herbaceous flora with a mono crop of grass. That is wiping out the habitat for such things as golden seal, ginseng, black cohosh, uh, aristolochia, what snake root is called, and many of these forest species are the ones that are most endangered. The way to save those is to maintain as much public park land as we can, because once it goes private, then it gets into private hands, and not all of them realize the value of diversity, both for their own good in providing p potential medicines in the future, but also for providing more food for different animals, for a different... The whole ecosystem spends around the diversity, and when you change everything to oak trees and one long grass, one grass lawn, you've lost many of your animals, your birds, your insects, and the things that make the world go round. 
So we need to maintain that diversity in any way that we can. Too often here in the United States, that means public parkland. And we've got to make sure that our politicians don't give that public parkland away to private interest because they may not have the best interest of diversity at heart. Well, Jim, thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to get ready, and, and if you wouldn't mind playing the Amazonian plant conservation. Oh, you got some words. We've got the words well, for Well, maybe I'll just, I'll just introduce. This is a takeoff about hauling away one of our adjacent states. Before you start, I just need to thank a few people <laughs> real okay, quick for this. I, I'd, I'd like to... I'll play background music. <laughs> perfect. I'd, I'd really like to thank the Distance Learning Crew, crew uh, Dick, Lisa, Mark, Clayton. Thank you very much for helping us do this. And I'd really like to thank those of you who took the time to watch this Distance Learning broadcast. And most of all, I'd like to thank Jim again for giving us so much information in such an entertaining manner. And then now I'll turn it over to your last song. Well, this is a parody on a great song by John Prine, and he called it Paradise, and I call mine Paradise Lost. Well, I praise you, John Prine, and I hope you don't mind. If I mess up your song to help the forest along. Even while I am singing, the axe man is swinging. Chopping down all that green to plant corn, rice, and beans. Oh, Daddy, won't you take me to the primary forest on the Amazon River where paradise lies? I'm sorry, my son, but the forest is gone. I'll show you some slides that's gonna have to suffice. I took my daughter down with me, between babies. And she said, Dad, if you'd shown me this 10 years ago, you wouldn't be a grandfather today. She would have been the ethnobotanist. She loved it. But she said, Dad, that's a sexist song you're singing. You gotta sing about mothers and daughters. So I added a non-sexist chorus. <laughs> oh, Mama, won't you take me to the primary forest on the Amazon River where paradise lies? So sorry, my daughter, but I don't think I ought to. We've waited too long, and now the forest is gone. Thank you, Jim. Don't let it happen. <laughs> Come with me and save that forest. <laughs> And uh, once again, thank you all for tuning into the Distance Broadcast. And this is the website if you want to learn more about uh, Dr. Duke's ethnobotanical and his phytochemical plant research. Thank you.